independent Americans around the country, around the world. Uh, we used to say this all the time, and I'm bringing it back. If you're not angry, you're not paying attention. I even brought back my angry Americans t-shirt because this is a time to be outraged. This is a time to be focused. This is a time to be involved. This is a time to learn. Um, and this is a time we needed to bring back one of our most important and inspiring guests. Uh, he's joined us twice before. He's a conscience, he's a personal hero, and I think he's a, a, a beating heart uh, for America in these trying, important, tumultuous times. I'm honored to have back on the program the great and powerful Fred Gutenberg returns to Independent Americans. Welcome back, my friend. My, my friend, thank you for the intro. Uh, I, uh, I, 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 uh, I'm not a hero, I'm a dad. Um, I would have been a hero if I were doing this before it was my daughter, but I wasn't. Uh, so, but I will never stop because my friend, you have kids and many others do, and they deserve to grow up better than um, what we have going on right now. Mm. There's a lot I wanna get into Fred, um, but I actually building off of that, you're a good dad. Uh, and I think a, a hard conversation to have around times like this is not everybody is a good dad or a good mom. Yeah. Not a lot of people put the time in, not a lot of people have the connection or the perspective. Not a lot of people really put kids first. Um, you know, many do, but many, but many don't. Right. And, and I think in times like this, you can tell who the good dads are and who the shitty ones are. Yeah. Um, and, and I think it's an important time to recognize that and call it for what it is. And, you know, you were on the show, episode 99, episode 74. It's been like 74 episodes or so. And I tweeted last week, why do we keep putting Fred through this? <laughs> why do we have to keep calling on him and asking him to do this? There's a lot we I want to unpack, but let me just ask you, you know, Fred, a question I ask everyone. You've been doing media nonstop for, you know, over a week. Uh, this is really personal for you. Where are you? Uh, where in the country are you? And how are you? Well, I'm home in Florida. Uh, today, for the first day, I think I'm uh, better than I was. I was in a really bad place last week after the shooting, and it lasted for a bit. Uh, I became emotionally, physically, and mentally drained. Um, I think anyone who saw me doing interviews last week probably saw me unable to to hold my emotion in check um, because it happened again. You know, it happened again. And it's, it would be, listen, we're never going to stop gun violence in America. Let's be honest. You know, with 400 million weapons on the streets of America, we're never going to stop it. But the fact that we can do even the bare minimum to try to prevent maybe one shooting, to prevent maybe one death, is so upsetting to me and last week i just had a hard time with that reality um but I, i'm in a better place today i am crystal clear today on where we are at i am crystal clear today on what we need to do and i am crystal clear today that my life's mission is still only in the early stages because your little kids, I want them to go to school and for you not to have this be the biggest worry you have. Hmm. So um, I appreciate your clarity because there's an old saying, clarity dissolves resistance. And there's a lot of resistance we got to cut through right now. But, you know, the no shit is um, I drive my kids to school this year because my little one is too young to take the bus and my kids are going to school together. And every day I drop them off, I, as a former infantry guy, you know, as a professional in security, I look around the campus and I see all the holes and I see all the vulnerabilities. Yeah. And I've even shared recommendations with the school. And uh, I did that this morning again. I shared with, with, with the leadership, here's some recommendations I hope you'll consider implementing. Uh, and then right before we got ready to tape this, my wife sent me a note that said, right after you sent that note, we got this. The elementary school, 11 minutes from my house that my son went to, last year had a lockdown today. They had a suspicious person in the hallway. 
you know, they went to a shelter in place, then they went to full lockdown. Um, and, you know, this is this is what we're, we're, we're sending them into. And I, I don't if you don't have kids in this environment, I don't know if you can fully appreciate it. I've said before, there's a couple of things you, you can only understand if you go through parenting, combat, the pandemic. Right. And this is kind of like all those things together to look at my three year old and, and try to explain to him you know what, your school may not be doing a good job on what to do in a tactical situation, I'm gonna train you, yep. um, is, 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 is our new normal, right? Tragedy is our, is our new normal. Oh, the most heartbreaking thing last, uh, there were several heartbreaking things, but hearing this one student talk about the training that they received in kindergarten and first grade that helped them to play dead, to protect themselves, I mean, kids putting blood on themselves to look like they were dead to protect themselves. And that's what we're needing to worry about in America today. Schools as war zones. I, it's so fucked up, it, it, you know, and it doesn't need to be that way. Can I can I ask you, um, you know, Uvalde is still unfolding. It is. Um, there's a component. I think the, the, the good guy with a gun myth may that may be one of the takeaways here is that maybe it's being exposed more now and, and in buffalo than in recent times every massacre and shooting is different this one is still unfolding and, and one of the things i've tried to highlight as a former infantryman as a former military police soldier is that people assume everybody shoots well right and and we may find out that that the cops may have hit one of the kids we don't know if that's the case there there are, there are but, suggestions of that right? possibly but in most police police shootouts a yeah. lot of people get caught in the crossfire you know everybody's not jason Bourne when their blood pressure is racing and you're being shot at and a guy in, in arm so the, the this this fetishizing of the tactical competence of the average guy with the gun or even an average cop i think is, is lunacy but not grounded in truth that's one of the takeaways for me from uvalde but can i ask you how is how is this one different in in your eyes how is you know, Uvalde different is it i'm different? gonna I, i'm gonna start with actually what you said about the good guy with the gun because we need clarity on that whole sentence. The first time it was ever, ever uttered by Wayne LaPierre, the good, the only thing that stops a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun. The very first time anyone ever heard that sentence was four days after Sandy Hook. That was the NRA response to Sandy Hook. Nobody ever used that line before. It was the NRA response to Sandy Hook. So the only thing that line ever actually accomplished was to sell a lot of guns. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that we know that because the good guy with a gun lie put us in a place where we now have to deal with the reality that law enforcement is outgunned. We now have to deal with the reality that while it started after Sandy Hook, the previous most deadly instance of elementary school kids, it's now bookended with Uvalde. Let's let's like have clarity on that. And so we, the, for me last week, really served as maybe the bookend on the NRA bullshit. Mm -hmm. And it is time for us to stop listening to those who do not care about our public safety, in fact, profit off of it and have for a lot of years. Because along with the good guy with a gun, what was the other lie that started at the same time? Slippery slope. If we do anything to reduce gun violence, we're going to go on a slippery slope. We've been on a slippery slope. It started with the utterance of that line after Sandy Hook. It has led us to the level of weapons we have on the streets today, to the number of people who die every day because of it. When my daughter was killed in 2018, we had 300 million weapons on the streets of America. We now have 400 million. That's a slippery slope. Mm. I, I want to stay focused on that because I, I have considered this a national security threat. It is. And, and, and I think that it's time to stop talking about it in, in other terms because we're losing more kids to gun violence than we are soldiers to combat. 
right? This is, is this is a national security. If ISIS was killing this many kids, we'd have total you, you know uh, unity in Congress. We'd be implementing the War Powers Act. We'd be changing everything we do to respond to a national security threat. Yet in this case, we don't. I I've, I've even tweeted that I think Biden should consider. He's got an AUMF, the Authorized Use of Military Force, to kind of have a blank check on all things having to do with the war on terror. Maybe there's a loophole in there he can use, right, to recognize this as a national security threat. But in in, in focusing in on that, you're bringing up what I think is the most important point, because I think we've, we chase shiny objects. Now it's going to be the 18 year old thing. And I want to talk about that with you, because yep, yep. Because, because I do think it's a shiny object. OK, I it don't is. think it's a bigger issue, because for me, I've said this on the show before. I wish the country would just pick one fucking age for adulthood in America, right? Because 18, you can join the Marine Corps. 18, you can't drink. 18, you can buy a gun. It varies by state. But just pick one age for adulthood. And then do and in the some real- states at 18, right. you can't buy a handgun, but you can an AR-15. Right, right. So I think this is a shiny object that's distracting people from the larger yeah. problem. Because w- what you need to do is address the access training availability of weapons that have massive killing power in my view right if you if you increase the weapons in iraq by 25 percent like we have here you'd have an increase in the insurgency period right so the access and availability of of all kinds of people to these weapons in my view is is the problem right i think we've got to get to the fact that assault weapons and and access to them is 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 a big target we can focus on do you do you agree and, well, and, well and, I do, and, but and what do you see as maybe the big targets policy wise yeah. that should be focused on? Because we've got to address the fact that we've got more guns than anybody, more deadly guns than anybody, and more availability of them than anybody. That I think is getting to the supply part of this of this problem. No, listen, I started this conversation with you talking about clarity. Because I'm done with bullshit. And I have clarity. And 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 clarity starts with what you said this is a national security threat and and it's not just about what's happening in schools and no you can't just harden schools to make it go away because kids walk on school campuses walk off of school campuses to walk to cars my greatest fear of what of the shooting in parkland is that it actually would have happened outside of the perimeter when my son was walking with my daughter to the car and i could have lost both kids so so this is a national security threat you now see you go to just places around america whether it's january 6th or the michigan uh um capital or a mom's demand rally where people show up with a or 15 strapped to their body as if that's normal but it's not And, and and so we do we have a national security threat so i agree with you we have to address the reality of access to AR-15s and other assault weapons and the amounts of ammunition being purchased. But I would take it further, okay? And here's, for me, the holy grail of saving lives from guns. We have 400 million weapons on the streets of America already. No background check on a future purchase does anything about that. Right. That's a fact. And so for me, the holy grail is ammunition. Because none of those weapons work without the bullets. In this country, if you are a prohibited purchaser of firearms, so you're one of the bad guys with a gun, maybe you stole it, maybe who knows where you got it from. If you are a prohibited purchaser of firearms, by law, you are prohibited from buying ammunition. However, there is no requirement for a background check on ammunition. So all those bad guys with a gun, they just simply walk into the store They break the law, but nobody checks and they buy the bullets. Mm -hmm. And because nobody checks and there's no requirement to check, when somebody walks in to buy over a thousand rounds, which is what the Uvalde killer had on him, nobody says, "Eh, maybe I ought to look into that a little more deeply. If we want to save lives in this country immediately, not stop gun violence. We're never going to be able to do that at this point, but we can reduce it. Let's do background checks on ammunition. Hey, you'd have my support on that. I think most Americans would probably support it like they do most common firearms reform. Um, You've met with President Biden in person. 
I have. Um, you've been a vocal supporter of him, but at the same time, you've been you know, challenging of him. Um, this is independent Americans. We know how this is going to go. Um, you know, Congress is probably going to run out the clock. They're going to go on summer break. They won't get anything done. You know, next year we're going to have a Republican led Congress. Uh, and, and it's probably going to be worse for folks like you that, that consider this, you know, their mission and, and are focused on this agenda. Um, what can Joe Biden do right now? What can he do so, right now to make this situation as uniquely as commander in chief, right? Not just as president, but also as commander in chief, the guy who's supposed to keep us safe. What do you think he can do right now to improve the situation? Well, I, I, let me answer that, but let me push back on you just a drop. Please. Um, cause, cause here's where we are at in this country with complete clarity. The majority of Americans want this done. The house of representatives is passing legislation to get this done. The president is ready to sign legislation to get this done. The Senate has 50 members who will vote for legislation to get this done. So with complete clarity, we know exactly where the problem lies. It's when the 50 members of the Senate who have decided they stand for nothing but no. And so I am with complete clarity seeing this as a completely political solution going forward. Um, they, they will not come to a bipartisan agreement. It's a charade. Mitch McConnell still can't say the word gun when he talks about Uvalde. So it's a charade. However, the Democrats, and I am communicating with them, they're done with the charade. They've allowed the bipartisan talk to go on every time in the past. This time, it's got one week to produce or not. And if not, they're putting the stuff up for a vote. And I think this is a must. Whether You know it's going to fail. I get it. But can we hold it there, Fred? Because this is where we always end up, right? The Senate will bring it forward. So there's a political solution that that's long term, right? We could argue November. You know, you and know, I don't. And, argue, and take I have, out Mitch McConnell. Yeah. Like let's let's vote out yeah. Mitch McConnell. That ain't going to happen. Maybe try to vote out Mansion and Cinema and other people that are on the bubble, right? That I think is is a viable. Not vote solution, them out. Right? Make them irrelevant. Okay. By voting in a few more Democrats. Okay. 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 Sure. But that's that's Senate change that won't take effect ideally until January of next year. I understand. Year. Probably not in this political environment. So we will reach another likely stalemate in the Senate or even conditions that are less favorable to, yep. to advocates like you. What can we do to work around it? What can so, so do right uniquely, now. uniquely the, right now within his power to change? The most it? immediate thing? Yeah. President Biden has appointed a permanent director of the ATF that we must get approved. Okay. okay. You, if you look at 90 or so percent of all firearms used in crimes, they come from about 5% of all the existing gun dealers. So a small minority of gun dealers are behind the majority of violent crime in this country. And yet we have not had a functional ATF director in about 10 years. Okay. You want to do something about that? Let's get him approved now. So and if anybody who's listening to this, you make sure your senator is going to vote for Dettelbach to be the permanent ATF director. That's number one. Which which now, Republicans will likely oppose? Um, there are. A, I actually think there will be a few who will vote for him this okay. uh, okay. uh, this time around. I'm hoping. And then, and then he's going to be a more aggressive sheriff. He'll he'll lock people up for breaking. You know what he'll do, Paul? What do you always hear the other folks say? We just need to um, focus on enforcing the existing laws. The right. problem is nobody did. Well, okay. now somebody will. Okay. Okay. So that's number one, but that's still out of Biden's control. That's still got to go to the Senate. Number one. Number two, keep searching for more executive action. The executive action that he's already done, for example, banning imports of ammunition from Russia, okay, where the bulk of ammunition that was flooding our streets was coming from. Okay, it, it was it was something that caught Ted Cruz's attention. So he actually wrote something about this just weeks before the Ovalde pushing Biden to remove that ban. It ain't going to happen. So it's a big deal dealing with ghost guns, which really are becoming the weapon of choice for really bad people because it keeps them off the grid. And Biden has done that. But he ought to be looking for other executive actions that he can do whether it's related to ammunition or capacity on ammunition or um, or any kind of potential uh, redefinition of weapons so that we can 
For example, I'd love to see AR-15s treated like machine guns are in this right. country right now. So things like that, executive action. So comprehensive executive action package. He sits in the Oval Office and says, here's a bunch of shit that my lawyers found we can do right now. Hopefully he signs something in the next couple of, of weeks, right? And then on the but political side, knock out guys like Mike Lee in Utah and replace them with an independent yeah, really, like yeah. Evan McMullen, right? In the meantime, Mitch McConnell's going to still be there. I'm thinking about, you know, I, the narrative seems to be changing, especially around the NRA. They had massive financial problems. You know, there is an increase in activism. Let, can we talk about the, the public perception and education piece? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's now a debate about whether or not to show graphic photos of the shootings. Yeah. I went through this in 2004 because people said, don't show the bodies of American soldiers. If you do, you're not patriotic. Right. There, there was even a, a protest against PBS listing their names daily. We've been through this before, yet through 20 years of war, you'd never see the body of a dead American. You wouldn't see it. You'd see other casualties. You see what the American press would agree not to show that cost of war. And in my view, that is a dereliction of duty. It shields the public um, from understanding the ground truth. What is your view on that? You lost your daughter. Yeah, you have a personal um, view. And I also think, you know, if possible, this is what always happens. They ask you your personal view, but they don't ask you your policy view, which is which is different to some extent, right? Because if I were killed in Iraq serving in our military, I wouldn't have a choice, right? It would be up to the government whether or not they allow my casket to be shown or not. And we can't have every parent in America opt in or opt out. So it's a two-part question. I know it's a thorny one, but what's your personal and or you know, a policy view, Fred? Listen, I'll, I'll answer it from both perspectives. Personally, I, I am not in favor of it. I don't believe the majority of Americans already support wanting to do something. The fact that you have a certain group in the Senate who simply won't listen to them won't be changed by this. I would never want publicly for the daughter, for the pictures of my daughter to be shown. Um, and so I, I don't think it will change the narrative. That's personal. Now I'm going to share something you, I've never shared with anybody else before. Because um, it gets to the policy piece. I did share them with Angus King and with um, uh, Joe Manchin prior to um, my pleading with them to vote the last time around when somebody was up to be a permanent director of the ATF um, and wanting them to put politics aside. And I wanted them to see my daughter and not just the photos. I wanted them to see the kids who were running over her body to escape. So there were photos of that too that I shared. So I've never shared that with anybody before. Mm. But I am sharing it here because it didn't change them. They are who they are. Mm. And so my impression is I'm more determined than ever to just make them irrelevant. Mm. Um, first off, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and, and I know having been around enough military survivors that there is this other conversation right? Like when, when the casualty officer comes or the police officer comes and you have belongings and, and the really tough part of this, that that part, I don't think people understand, Fred. I think one of the most powerful images is, is the customized coffins for these kids. Like that for me is like, um, you know, the dead Syrian refugee kid on the beach. That is a, an iconic image that may not move Mansion and King, but might move the movables might move independence, right? That we talked to at, at, at a great length. In, in the same way, the kids after Parkland, I think really made an impact. And I wanna, I wanna build on that in a way, Fred, and ask you another question. In war, people only count the dead. They don't appreciate how many people come home wounded, physically, mentally. Um, you lost Jamie. Jesse got out. Jesse mm -hmm. experienced that. Um, Jesse's 21 now, Yeah. right? Yeah. Um, can you talk about as much as you're comfortable and whatever is appropriate, yeah. what, that side of this? Because all, many of these families lost kids and many of these families 
have kids that are scarred, wounded for life. And that's a part of the, the, the human cost that I don't think the country is fully grasping. Can you talk I, about that, I, much as you're comfortable sharing? No, I will. And, and I thank you for asking this question. I, I tried to raise this point a bit last week on the media. Gun violence isn't only about those who are shot and killed that we bury. It is about all the collateral damage of everyone else that was there and the families and the communities. I always talk about um, Jesse and, and because it's important for people to always remember. He heard the bullets that killed his sister and I was on the phone with him when it happened. He was crying, Jesse was on the phone with me crying, Dad, I have to turn around to find Jamie. And I'm telling him, you can't, you have to keep running. I didn't want him running towards the bolts. I wanted him running away. But he saw himself as his protector of his sister. And I literally, it took everything I had for me to convince him to keep running. And as we're on the phone, he's like, there's more shots. Those were the ones on the third floor that killed Jamie. And he heard it loudly and clearly. To this day, Jesse has still got issues with the fact that I convinced him to run, that he didn't turn around, that it was her and not him. And, you know, you can put any names you want on it. Survivor guilt, for sure, PTSD. My son had a lifelong dream of becoming a paramedic firefighter. It's not going to happen anymore because of concerns over things that he might see mm -hmm. that could make this all real again. Um, and so his life is forever altered, forever. Not just what he's gonna do with his life, but the loss of his sister, his baby sister who he protected. That's that's what he saw his role. And, and so my wife and I, our life is forever altered. Um, he's now an only child. And, and um, so it changes our whole approach with him. Our people need to understand gun violence isn't only about those we bury. It is also about those who survived that we need to worry about for the rest of our lives and concern ourselves with because they will be forever impacted. Fred, we... we um... We say on the show a lot, look for the helpers. And you wrote a book, right? Um, find the helpers. Find the helpers soon after you came on the show last time. Um, your voice is so powerful. And, and you know, we can relate in, in some ways because every time there was a military tragedy for like 15 years, they'd call me. I was the designated outrage guy on TV. <laughs> Right. And then and then and, and, and then I tried to offer solutions, which you do. And I tried to advocate for policy change, which you do. Um, I never went the next step. And I, and I wonder if you will. You've got Marco Rubio in the Senate. Um, you've got a terrible governor. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of people who would support you, Fred. And I don't know. I, mean, I know you're a loyal Democrat. Um, but if you ran as an independent or a Democrat, you'd, you'd have my support. Um, do you, do you ever feel like you need a bigger hammer and an elected office might be the, the way to, to wield it? So I'll, I'll, I'll answer that by telling you, um, what took place over the past year. As everyone knows, I consider Congressman Ted Deutsch a dear friend and he is retiring from the house, um, months before that became public, he spoke to me about it, hoping that I would run for his seat. Um, and he tried for a while after I said no the first time to convince me to run for his seat. Um, and the answer was no, and it's going to stay that way. L listen, I'll say this. Had I, this maybe happened 10, 15 years ago, maybe my perspective would be different. But I'm at a place in my life now where the idea of being political, of moderating what I want to say, how I want to say it, who I want to tell off, if I want to use a four-letter word, 
if I want to tell somebody truly how I feel, all those things, I just don't care to moderate. I, I am who I am. Um, and the need to fundraise and get along with as many people as possible because of the need to fundraise would make it impossible for me to run for anything. Um, I think, I think if you, if you decided to run, the second part would go away. I don't think you'd have a hard time fundraising. The first part, none of that ever stopped Donald Trump. None of that ever no, stopped Ron DeSantis. And in your state especially, they <laughs> love supporting people who use four-letter words, who don't give a shit what people think, and are unconventional politicians. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you a little bit and say, you know, I appreciate that. You don't want to do it. But this might be a moment where where you were called upon because we need you. I'm going to start the draft. But Paul, Fred let movement. me ask you a question. I'm gonna, I, hold on, I'm going to start what? the draft Fred movement because we don't have <laughs> someone like you in the Senate. We don't have someone like you as a governor. And we need, in the same way, people are going to run and say, hey, I was a, everybody wants to say I was a veteran. Everybody wants to say I was a cop. Everybody wants to say I was a surgeon. We're very, I don't think, is, is there anybody, um, Carolyn McNally, right? Or was it from from New York that had that had McCarthy? Lost, McCarthy, McCarthy, sorry, who, yeah. who lost a family member to a, a shooting on a train, right? Yeah, yeah. Outside of that, has there ever been a shooting survivor? Lucy uh, McBath. I would say thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, but there's so, no. But we we need a governor. We need we need a senator. We need someone who can tell these stories and who can fight for parents. So you don't have to agree with me on this one fred but i'm going to start the draft fred movement but but here's the thing what whether i get elected or not the question is where do i have how can i have more impact yeah. and and i'm not sure being one of a whole load of votes gives me more impact than coming in listen any center i want to talk to i'm capable of doing it yeah. any house member i want to talk to i do it I want to. I, I, I talk to the. I want to talk to the know, president. I can do why, it after man. this. <laughs> here's why. Here's why. If you're in the Senate, you got something to trade, right? You got your vote, and you and you will be in the spotlight on every issue. Like I would love to hear Fred on Ukraine. I would love to hear Fred on inflation. I would love to hear Fred on the baby formula problems and gas prices, because you know the challenge with an advocate like you and me and so many others is we got to wait for the news cycle. Right. And then we're in the news nonstop for a week and then we're gone for four weeks. Right. And, and yes, we're still making calls. We're still beating down the door, but people have moved on to something else. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to tell you that I think there's a more of a case for you, especially because what a contrast you would be to Ron DeSantis. What a contrast you would be to Marco Rubio. And you fight. You know how to punch somebody in the face politically in the media. Oh, and I plan on doing that through the election. Trust me. <laughs> Well, let me let me let me ask you a, a, a final question, Fred. Other than when you know, if you do declare, come back on my show to do it. Um, you are amazingly inspiring, and you know you're candid about how you're processing trauma. I had a great conversation last episode with Bonnie Carroll that I encourage folks to check out. Um, a lot of folks are feeling down. Yeah. A lot of folks have texted me in the last couple of weeks, especially parents. I mean, I've got a friend who is uh, a gay parent, veteran, sure. uh, female, who feels like everything is under attack, okay? And and there's a lot of folks who are like, you know what, I could live in Toronto for a little while and, or somewhere else and it would be better for my family. How do you get through this? How do you, how do you keep yourself and your family um, through? How do you get through this, man? How do you do it? Because I do travel the country and I do meet people everywhere I go. And what I realize is the majority of people in this country are good and decent and feel the way that I do. The fact that our politics has been upended by a minority isn't who America is. And and so <clears throat> here's here's how I get through it. After Jamie was killed, I set out on a plan to as I said back then, break the fucking gun lobby. To a large extent, we, we've been successful. And to make gun violence prevention a dominant voting issue. And we did. And if you look at 2018, we turned the House mainly on this issue. If you look at 20, okay, we elected a president 
large, large part on this issue, other things too, the former guy helped. Um, and if you look at the Senate, we moved to 50-50 and we are, we've got the control. Bare, barely, but we got it. If I would have told you four years ago that we were going to do all those things, you would have told me I was crazy. That there's no chance this country could have that kind of a result, but we did. I look at this this way. Because I got to know Americans, all I need them to do is show up and vote. That's all I need them to do. And if we do it in November, we're going to be okay. If people show up, we still have the president, we can hold the House, and we can add seats in the Senate. I believe in the people of this country. Listen, Paul, we have done in this country a terrible job of voting for a lot of election cycles. And I don't mean we voted for the wrong people. Too many of us just didn't vote. And so we ended up with the wrong people. But in the last two election cycles, more people showed up. If we get presidential year turnout in this upcoming midterm, we're going to be okay. And it's a tall ask getting people to show up and vote. So anyone who listens to this, here is my ask of you. Don't wait till election day to figure it out. Start working on your voting plan now. Make sure your registration is set now. Make sure any ID requirements you have figured out now so that when the time comes to vote, you're not scrambling. It's actually going to be easy. But start now. And move to Florida and vote for Fred as a write-in <laughs> candidate in every election that you can. I'm not letting this one go, man, because I do see a future where there's like, I mean, it's tragic, but, you know, there's an Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans Caucus now. Right? No, there man, be, listen, one of these days, be, I'm looking for the day where I can show up at Sunday morning car shows with you, with our old cars, and yeah. hang out. Um, We're going to do that, too. But, you know, there could be a day where you and, like, Daniel Hogue and David Hogue and, and Shannon Watts and all these folks are, like, actually elected and you have a caucus, a voting block. That would be impressive. So I'm going to hold out hope for that. Even as an independent, I, I stand with the activists and I will definitely take you up on the car show. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to ask you to stick around for two minutes and do some quick fire questions for our Patreon members who help keep this going. But thank you, man. For, thank for you. Every, every time you tell this story, it's painful for you and it's a sacrifice. And in my view, leadership is about sacrifice and you continue to sacrifice on behalf of all of us and on behalf of our kids and on behalf of your kids and your fucking inspiration, man. And I love you and I appreciate you and, and we'll do anything we can to support you and your family and, and the movement. I appreciate you, my friend. Stay vigilant, my friend. You count on it. <laughs>